chapter 1. I'll be referencing there throughout the study. I'm going to call it a study because that's what it is. It's very rare that I come across a study guide that I like to take, to take right to the pulpit. This is one of them. One of the best study guides I think I've ever came across that I could bring to the pulpit. The subjects in this study guide is what everybody is affected by. All of us are affected by it. Every one of them. Let me re list some for you. Now, you'll know why I, I brought this with me. Here are some topics we're going to look at. Fear is our first one. Discouragement. Loneliness. Worry. Guilt. Temptation. Anger. Resentment. Doubt. Procrastination. Failure. Jealousy. I don't know how many of those we'll get in, but I'll tell you, every one of those affect every one of us here. Every one of us are affected in some way by these subjects. And I thought, I just had to share what we've been sharing in our Bible study with the rest of the family. Just needed to do that because it's so important, so good. Did I send the little ones back? Did I? Got my mind on other stuff. My wife said, you know, the Gideon speaker's going to speak sometime. I said, well, when I find out, I'll let the church find out. Ha! I'll tell you how this works. Brother Apple usually calls me in December when I don't have a new calendar. And I jot it on a piece of paper. Well, you might as well just put that in the wind because that don't work. <laughs> Anytime you put something on a slip of paper, that just doesn't work. Somehow or another, it just gets lost. So that doesn't work. I just got to try to get a new calendar in December because I know Brother Apple calls and schedules his Gideon speakers. I probably does that to all the places. So anyway, they might have the same problem I have. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help me here today. As you know, this is a message that affects all of us. And we need your guidance with these subjects. We need your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our study guide, um, there's usually always an overview, an introduction. As Brother Elroy says, we're going to set the stage. Well, we're going to set the stage with this overview. If it sounds like I'm reading, it's because I am. Uh, the material is so good and so factual that I don't want to leave anything out. I might skip a few places that but uh, I'll pretty much try to get as much in today as I can. We're looking at spiritual giants that invade our lives. I'm just sort of catching a few things and going on. One of the first of the giants we're going to look at is this giant of fear. Many people have phobias. You know what phobias are? You've got some scary things that you just don't like. I might make a suggestion here of some of the things that, like spiders, for example. Some people don't like spiders. Through the years, painting, I got used to them. I'd paint, and there was something crawling around on me. I knew it was a spider. So, you know, whatever. It, it didn't really bother me. Uh, bats. Some people don't like bats. I carried shutters down off of a ladder with bats on the back of the shutter. It didn't bother me. Yeah, you remember that day, don't you? Yeah, I didn't like it either. But I noticed that something, I felt something at my belly here when I was carrying the shutter down off the ladder, and here I looked at the shutter, and there was nothing but bats hanging on the back of it. Oh, brother. I guess you know I dropped that shutter. I didn't want to have that. Okay, so we're talking about phobias. Phobias. Uh, there's all kinds of things. Some, how many are afraid of heights? I'm not real keen on that either, huh? Uh, where was it? We went to uh, Tennessee. They had a skyline bridge. And brother, that thing just wobbled back and forth. And the people walking across that, they're crazy. And I walked across it, I thought I was crazy. This thing's moving like, you ever go across something like that? Little? And then they put a glass in the middle. Of the, no, 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 I don't want to bother looking at that. I just... Go on, let's go. Get this show in the road. Get out of here. Let's go. Then when I got across, I thought, you dummy, you got to go back again. <laughs> you dummy. 
So I waited till you know, there wasn't nobody. I didn't want to go across from anybody else was going on there. I'm afraid the thing's going to fall with just me on it. <laughs> oh, brother. All right, we're talking about phobias, heights, open spaces. I don't know about that. How about airplanes? <laughs> I know a few people don't like airplanes. Well, there's some other things. What phobia? Do you know snakes? What I don't say about snakes. I'm not scared to death of them. I just don't like to be surprised. You know, when I'm moving something, I don't like to move it and pick it up. And there's this thing curled up out of there. Then I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like them surprises. I want to see them. I'm okay if I know where they're at. I can see them. But I don't really like when they're hiding. I'm not, I don't like that at all. Phobias. Do you know there's more than 100 different phobias? More than 10% of the population suffers from one or more of these phobias. I used to think I wasn't scared of tight places, you know, really tight places. Um, some people can't do the MRI. You know, they don't like to be in that tight enclosure. And then it sounds like somebody's outside hitting it with a ball peen hammer. <laughs> uh, yeah, some people don't like that. That never really bothered me. But I'll tell you what did bother me. When we were in New York for my granddaughter's surgery, we were in Times Square, and we were involved in that just population explosion in Times Square where the people, you just, you know, you, ever, you all moved at one time. There was that many people. You just moved at one time. I didn't like that at all. Not at all. One other, one, only, only one other time in my life I was there like that. That was at Disney. Remember that, Dick and Joyce, when we were... Oh, brother, that was bad. I thought that their boat we went on that would, we're going to sink with all them people on it. Okay, enough for that. Everyone experiences fear at different times. Some people don't like to speak in front of people. Uh, you know, it's just one of those fears that some people don't like. I've, you know, the more you do it, the, the more you get used to it. But some people have a fear of talking in front of people. How about every parent has at one time experienced fear when his or her children have been injured or put into a new situation in which they weren't prepared? Any parent here that's ever had any teenagers knows what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Some of us experience fear when we're told that we have a serious disease. Wow, that'll knock your socks off when you're told you got some kind of terrible disease. When fear takes over, there's a giant that needs to be conquered. We see these certain times that's happened in the scripture. The disciples were on the Sea of Galilee during a fierce storm. They were afraid. These were fishermen. Obviously, a, a storm much different than what they were used to. This was a real storm, and they were afraid. And so our story takes us today to the 12 spies. They were to go out to the promised land and spy it out. The real story is actually recorded in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. The uh, one we have in Deuteronomy chapter 1, 19 through 40, is a condensed version of the same story found in Numbers chapter 13 uh, and 14. Israel's been freed from slavery. They are now approaching the promised land, of course, under Moses' leadership, and he chooses out 12 spies. You all know where they came from? One from each tribe. One spy from each tribe. So the first thing we're going to look at about fear is fear disregards God's plan. Fear disregards God's plan. Now, if you have your Bible in your lap, uh, verses 19 and 21 of Deuteronomy chapter 1 is where we're at. These are the two verses now that we're going to look at. God's plan for the Israelites was to go, go and to possess the land of Canaan. In verse 21, we see fear and discouragement. Discouragement we'll be sharing about probably, Lord willing, next Sunday. What controlled these people? It's, it's serious. It's sad. What it is is very sad that 10 spies chose to see things differently 
It's like, and Elroy brought it up about a pessimist and an optimist. You know, the 10 spies, they were pessimists. They saw, they saw the bad things. They saw things that were discouraging. They, they looked at it as being discouraged. And here's what I think. There was only two that had a good word to say, an encouraging word. And I believe that Joshua and Caleb, they were, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to say what they said, to see what they saw. And I believe the other 10 spies are just like the natural man that's on, been on regenerated. It's just like natural, natural men that's been uh, affected by sin. And, and of course, everything else about, about uh, life has been because of sin. We see things in that respect. And I believe that those 10 were affected by that. By affected by that. And, and because they didn't have a Holy Spirit working in their life. And so then we, we find that only the Lord would allow Joshua and Caleb to go in. And do you know what happened to the rest of the people? They died off. Only their children were allowed to go in and possess the land. They all died off. Now we're talking about the same people that were in Egypt and saw all the miracles that God performed in Egypt. Same people saw all that happening and still they didn't have the courage or the ability to see that, don't you know, if God brought you through Egypt, God will take you to the promised land. Don't you know that? Don't you understand the same miracle God that got you out of Egypt will get you into the promised land? Don't you see that? It's sad to me that they didn't see that. And they, and they allowed the report from these 10 other spies to affect them, infected all of them. It was an infection. It's terrible. So we find out here's what Apostle Paul has to say. We know the warning that Moses gave to them that they needed to, to go in and possess the land. And Paul, the Apostle Paul gave us a similar warning. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7. You see, God has not created us to be creatures dominated by fear. He's given us faith for which we can live, and we can choose to either live in fear or live by faith. I hope and trust that you will learn to live by faith. It's the same principle that Paul gave in the book of Romans, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Romans 8 and 15. The second thing we see, fear distorts God's purposes. Not only does it disregard God's plan, but it distorts God's purposes. Whenever fear dominates our life, everything gets out of perspective. Everything gets distorted. Ten of those spies returned to Canis Barnea. They brought back a totally distorted picture of what the promised land was really like. And so we can find their report in verse 27 and 28. You have the scripture laying there in your lap. Their report is, can be found there. They came back and reported that the promised land was filled with Anakin. Anakim. Anybody know what Anakim is? Giants. That's right. A race of giants, some believed to be 12 to 18 feet. We know Goliath was somewhere beyond nine feet tall. Have there been skeletons found of this? Yes, there have been, but the government conceals it. They don't want you to know anything about it. Yes, there have been, there have been giants found. The skeletons have been found. You don't hear nothing about that because the devil don't want you to hear anything about that. The Bible talks about it, but the devil don't want you to know anything about it. So it's concealed. The government hides things like that. They don't, things they can't, the things they can't uh, define or explain, they just as soon keep it up in wraps. They don't want to startle anybody. But skeletons have been found between 12 and 18 feet. They are a race of giants upon which Goliath was part of, was one. Goliath had four other brothers. That's why David took five stones. Goliath had four other brothers. Their fear caused them to see one thing. 
They saw great cities which were fortified according to what they said in the scriptures. It said that the walls were as high as heaven. Oh, come on. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but that's what the scripture says. You can read it. It said the walls were as high as heaven. Well fortified. Hello, did you forget about Jericho? Huh? Did you all forget about Jericho? What happened to Jericho? They just marched around and the walls came tumbling down. Where was you at or didn't you read that? <laughs> did you forget about that? Children of Israel, didn't you understand? Did you never hear about that? <laughs> Hello. Wow. Now, now, they saw great cities. They were fortified. When fear begins to control your life, you do not think correctly. Rationality goes out the window. That is, if you choose to let fear control your thinking. And if you do, you'll have a distorted view of the situations that you find yourself in. And really, life in general. Everything will be totally out of perspective. You'll think that God brought you to a terrible situation just to do you harm, is what they said. He brought us here just to destroy us. Come on. You know better than that. God loves you. He didn't bring you here to destroy you. Third thing, fear discourages God's people. We'll be looking at discouragement. In fact, I think depression and discouragement go together. We'll be looking at discouragement. It discourages God's people. The kind of fear that controls is a very highly con and very contagious. Evidently, it was contagious because look how much it affected everybody. Look how contagious it was. It, it infected millions. I think there was somewhere around 6 million is the figures. Can you imagine? How, many, how do you get that many people? Look at all those people that were affected by those 10 men that came back and, were, and allowed, them, allowed themselves to be controlled by fear. Those 10 men determined the destiny of the rest of the entire nation for the next 40 years. Their words of fear so infected the rest of the people that the entire nation became fearful of going into the land that God had promised them. The fearful words of 10 people turned the fortunes of an entire nation. Let's say it. Somebody said that when the spies came back from the land of Canaan, they not only talked about the giants they saw, they brought back one of the giants with them, the giant of fear. They brought back with them. And that giant walked through Israel's camps and destroyed everything that was in the heart of the whole nation. And a fear like that is like someone yelling fire in the midst of a crowded theater. And without any knowledge of the facts, panic sets in and causes a stampede among hundreds of people. The entire landscape changes when one or more people are consumed by fear. Isn't that the truth? You've heard that happen. You've heard of things like that happening. Fear disbelieves God's promises. It questions God's promises. Hmm. Wasn't he the God who worked mighty miracles in Egypt? Moses reminded them in verses 29 through 33. He reminded them what God had done in Israel in the past. His promise keeping. He certainly would keep his promise to deliver them into Israel, into the land of milk and honey. Instead, fear caused Israel to question the promises of God or disbelief. Think of all the things God did for them. The plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the giving of the law, the provision of water. They found that rock, by the way. It's in Saudi Arabia. The actual rock where water came out. It's uh, very distinguishable because you know what water does to rocky surfaces? What's it do? It makes them what? Smooth. So they know that this was the place where it actually occurred because the huge rock is very big and it's split right through the middle. I have a picture of it. 
The rock is split right through the middle. And all the rocks around it are smooth. Caused to be very smooth because of the erosion of the water running over it. So they found it in Saudi Arabia. Of course, you can't go see it because of Saudi Arabia. They have it partitioned off. Isn't that just the devil's way of keeping people from finding out the truths of God? Uh Uh-huh. That's a fact. And do you know that Mount Sinai has words actually today is not really where it occurred. It actually is in Saudi Arabia. It's there. Because there they found proof, writings of the golden calf. They found the pillars that was erected at the foot of the mountain. They found those pillars. But that's in Saudi Arabia. Well, they can't change it now. Look at the millions of tourists that go to the one in Israel, Mount Sinai there. But don't you remember Apostle Paul spoke about Sinai being Saudi Arabia? Paul said about it. He mentioned it. Yeah, he did. All right, so much for that. Where was I at? Disbelieving God's promises. Thinking about all those things God did. He provided water and food in the wilderness. He defeated the enemies. He guided them by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud of pillar of cloud by the day. He carried Israel through the wilderness as a father would carry his child. So many things God did and provided for him. Another thing that fear does, it disobeys God's principles. When we don't believe, we usually don't obey. Verse 26 is where I'm getting that. If we don't believe, we usually don't obey. Israel rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. You see, fear is disobeying God. Many, many times the Bible were told, fear not. We have 365 fear nots in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? That's a bit interesting to me. We have one for every day, 365 fear nots. That's amazing. God's amazing. Do not be afraid. We're told by God not to fear. And if we choose to live in fear, what are we doing? We're disobeying God. God tells us not to, and we still do it. We're disobeying. And because the people did not obey God, they did not go into the land and receive from God what he had promised to give them. That generation spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness, slowly dying off until their children's generation was of adult age. And the only two allowed to go into the land was Joshua and Caleb. You see, when fear grips our lives, it ultimately destroys everything that God wants to do in and through us. I've known people to whom God had given a vision, a direction for life and ministry, who failed to follow through what God had given for them because of fear. And their lives became rambling, meaningless journeys. Instead, it could have been a focused and perfect purposeful mission, but fear can steal the very thing that God wants to give you. So what do we do when fear is knocking on the door of our heart? How do we keep it from gaining control? I'm going to give you five reasons. Looks like I got time to do that. 15 minutes. Praise the Lord. I'm glad I got time. Okay. Fear demands a biblical response. This isn't this. This is excellent material. The first thing you need to do is confront your fear, honestly. You need to confront it. Recognize it. Recognize it for what it is. You need to confront it if you want to get rid of it. Discover what it is that's given fear an invitation to take up residence in your life. Find out what's causing the problem. Why? Discover what it is that's given you this fear. And then face it, honestly. If you don't know what it is, ask God in prayer. Ask him. Get counsel from a trusted friend or pastor. You're not going to get rid of something you can't identify. You need to identify it so you can get rid of it. And then you need to confess your fear. God says, fear not. And when we fear, we disobey God. Disobeying God is sin. And all sin needs to be confessed. 
You may not be able to command your feelings, but I can tell you that you can command your will to obey the voice of the Lord and fill your life with his truth. In Psalms 34, 4, it says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. You see, where our will goes, our feelings, our feelings follow. If we seek the Lord and obey him and we dwell in the Lord and we meditate on the Lord's word, we will find our feelings. Too many have tried to get rid of fear without even recognizing it and confessing it as sin. What God has forgiven and removed will not have dominion over you. How far did he say he'd separate your sins? From what? As far as the east is to the west, have I removed your sins from you? He promised he'd do that. Then you need to claim God's promises of protection. Claim them. They belong to you. You are his children. They belong to you. If you're overcome by fear, here's what Brother David Jeremiah has shared. And I read exactly what he did. I would take a stack of index cards and fill them with verses from from the scriptures that have to do with fear, as many as I could locate. I'd put one verse on each card. Then I'd put the cards in places where you will see them all day on your car visor or dashboard or on the bathroom mirror, on the kitchen counter, on your desk at work, in your purse or wallet, in a coat pocket, everywhere you go, take the word of God with you to remind you of the truth about fear. That's what he wrote. That's his personal words. Wherever you are, the spirit of fear begins to intimidate you. And you will have the truth of God near at hand instead of following your mind to be filled with fearful lies. Fill it with the word of God and tell the enemy when he begins to whisper to you about fear, forget it. I have a word from God that says, fear not. In the 90s, Moody Magazine had a fascinating story about a Canadian family who was growing fearful about the likelihood of another world war. They wanted to move to a location in the world where peace would be assumed. So they moved to the British-controlled Falkland Islands off the coast of Argentina in March of 1982. Five days later, the Argentine army invaded the Falkland Islands and the family found themselves in the middle of a war. You see, that's how fear is. It will follow you wherever you go unless you confront it. Hmm. And then cultivate a closer relationship with God. What was it about these two 12 spies who weren't fearful? (laughs) I already shared that with you. See, I believe they had a special relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's what I think made the difference. They had a special relationship. And you know, Christians usually have a different outlook on life than people who don't know Jesus. They usually have a different outlook. Most of the time, Christians have a better outlook on life. They should. They should. Because they can trust the Lord for everything in their life. They should have a better outlook. And Joshua and Caleb have had a better outlook. In Deuteronomy 1.36, Numbers 14.24, and and verse chapter 32 and 12, All these passages say that Joshua and Caleb followed the Lord. See, that's what made the difference. This was the difference between these two who were courageous and the 10 who were fearful. You see, they had a relationship with God that was the dominant force in their lives. And so as a result, there was no room for fear. When they saw giants in walled cities, they said, our God can handle this. What's to fear? Where the others saw obstacles, Joshua and Caleb saw God. What's the saying? The bigger they are, 
the harder they fall. God's perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4, 18. And so God enfolds us in his loving arms, and he casts out all fear. And then lastly, I didn't think I'd get through this. Thank you, Lord. Commit your life to Jesus Christ. The greatest fear anyone could have is the fear of death. Wow. I remember talking with one, and she's not here anymore because the Lord took her home. She said she had a terrible fear of death. And I remember speaking and sharing with her, and I got her past the fear of death. We prayed, and the Lord took her home soon after that. But she said her, her wonderful thing was that she didn't have to be afraid to die anymore. It was something that was always looming in her life. She was afraid to die. I hope that's not the case with you today. I hope you're not afraid. You shouldn't be. And you don't need to be as long as you commit your life to the Lord. Commit your life to him. It's, it's one of the greatest fears that I believe that can be conquered. Accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Accept the gift of eternal life that's offered by Jesus Christ. You see, if you're a Christian, you can be certain of your eternal life. You've already conquered the greatest fear. No other fear should concern you. If you're not a Christian today, and live not, you live not only in the fear of death, but of other things as well. So I invite you today to accept God's gift of love for you, Jesus Christ. Remember, his perfect love casts out all fear. So if you're listening to me by way of internet, I pray that you'll do that today. Take a moment to confess your sins to him and ask him to come into your life today and get rid of that fear of death along with all the other fears that many times can come to us. Amen. I'm going to have the worship group come.